Praise the Lord. If you are there, I said, Praise the Lord. Let's rise up as we pray together. A gracious God, we thank you for this moment and for this hour. Thank you for the revelation of your word. Thank you for Jesus Christ, a savior, a sanctifier, our healer, a baptizer in the Holy Ghost, the coming king, and the supplier of every need. Lord, we're asking you that you open our eyes to the provision of Christ for every soul and for every member of his church in Jesus' name. He is the bridegroom and we are the bride. And we know that the bridegroom, the Lord, has prepared a lot for everyone in his church. We're asking the Lord that our faith will see and grasp and take hold of everything you have provided for us in Jesus' name. And we're asking, Lord, will be the kind of bride you want us to be. The church you want us to be waiting for the coming of the Lord. And Lord, we pray the work of grace you do in every heart will abide until you come. The sustaining grace, the sanctifying grace, the sufficient grace you grant to everyone and will be faithful until you come. Thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. And the church shout, Amen. We're coming to John chapter 3. And I'm reading from verse 26. John chapter 3. Verse 26 all through to verse 29. In verse 26 it says, And he came to John and said unto him, Rabbi, Master, Teacher, Leader, Lord, He that was with thee beyond Jordan, to whom thou bearest witness, behold, the same baptizes, and all men come to him. John answered and said, A man can receive nothing except it be given him from heaven. Ye he yourselves bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but that I am saint before him. He that has the bride is the bridegroom. John is now revealing to us the revelation of the church. And he's referring to the church as the bride. Referring to Christ as the bridegroom. And he says he, that is the Christ. He that he is the Lord. He, the bridegroom, has the bride. The bride belongs to him completely, entirely, and at all times. And he says, for the friend of the bridegroom, referring to himself, which standeth and heareth him, rejoices greatly, bridegroom's voice. This, my joy, Therefore, is fulfilled. Actually, those who came to John the Baptist, they wanted to spring jealousy and envy in him. And he said, you know what? The man that came to you, and you baptized him, and you bore witness concerning him, the same he has started his ministry now, and is baptizing and more people are coming to him. And they said, all men actually come to him. And he said, but you bore me witness. I told you, he is the bridegroom. He is the Lord. He is the Christ. He is the Messiah. He is the Savior. I am not the Savior. And the bride is responding to him. I pray that today you respond to him. Your heart will take hold of him. 
your mind will take hold of him. Your consecration, your submission will take hold of him in Jesus' name. And then he tells us in Versace, he says, he must increase, but I must decrease. The New Testament reveals to us that Jesus Christ is the husband and the church is the wife. Another word for the husband is bridegroom. Another word for the bride, that is for the wife, is bride. We're looking at 2 Corinthians chapter 11. And I'm reading here from verse 2. 2 Corinthians chapter 11 verse 2. For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy. Here is Paul, the apostle talking. A preacher, a pastor, an apostle. A person that God had sent to bring people out of the world to the Lord. Out of darkness to the light. And out of their sin to the Savior. And as they come to the Lord, they become part of the bride. The church of the living God. And then he said, I'm jealous over you. What did he mean by that? He said, I'm jealous over you because I want you to belong completely, entirely, wholeheartedly, without any reservation, unto Christ, unto the bridegroom. And I'm so jealous, I don't want you to have any part of your life, any part of your being, any part of your character belonging to Satan. Because the bridegroom wants to have the bride totally, entirely, and completely. And I'm jealous over you with godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband. Again, he's telling us about the Christ, the bridegroom, the husband. The head of the church. He said, when I prayed to you, when I invited you, when I wanted you to come, invite you to Christ, I espoused you to one husband, bridegroom, that I may present you a chaste virgin to Christ. That is, a chaste, righteous, holy, pure, bright, without blemish unto Christ unto the bridegroom in Ephesians chapter 5 Ephesians chapter 5 now tells us from this epistle written by inspiration through the pen of Paul the apostle it now tells us the details about the bride as he explains in details concerning the bride and the bridegroom we're looking at Ephesians chapter 5 and I'm reading from verse 23 it says, for the husband is the head of the wife. You can see the bridegroom is the head of the bride. Even as Christ is the head of the church. Makes it very clear. Makes it very plain. He's talking about Christ, the bridegroom. Talking about Christ, the husband. He's talking about Christ, the head of the church. And it says, even as Christ is the head of the church. And he is the savior of the body. Talking about the body of Christ. It's referring to the church in various terms. The church is bride. The church is wife. The church is the body of Christ. And Jesus, the Savior. Jesus, the Lord. Jesus, the bridegroom, is the head and the Savior of that body. He says, therefore, in verse 24. As the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands, in everything, he's talking about Christ, and he's saying, and he's bringing in the family. He says, "We're going from the known to the unknown. We're going from what we're familiar with, with what we're not to what we're not familiar with." You understand that the wife ought to be subject to the husband in everything, and he says, "The bride of Christ also needs to demonstrate that love, that faithfulness, that loyalty." That commitment, that surrender, that consecration, that we need to submit to Christ, the bridegroom, the head of the church, in everything. In verse 25, husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church. You see, he's bringing in the human family to tell us about the heavenly family. It says, husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church. And he gave himself for it. Why? That he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. That he might present it to himself 
What kind of church? Tell me out aloud. A glorious church. That's the church you belong to. I said that the church you belong to. Saved, a glorious church. Sanctified, a glorious church. Filled with power from on high, a glorious church. Soul winning, evangelizing, a glorious church. A church that wants to retain the glory of God. That wants to have his light shining before men. That all may see and glorify your Father who is in heaven. And it says, not having sport or equal or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself, for no man ever yet hateth his own flesh, but nourisheth. And cherisheth it, even as the Lord, the church. You see, all the time, he goes to the human family. He's borrowing, he's making use of that human family like a picture, like a pattern, like a parable. And then he comes to the church, and he says, church, this is what you ought to be, to be the bride. Because Christ is that heavenly bridegroom. And then he goes on to say in verse, in verse 30, For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. That's talking about the human family. Immediately he switches on, to the heavenly family, Christ and the church, the bridegroom and the bride, the head and the body, the statue. This is a great mystery. But I speak concerning Christ and the church. The status three, nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife, even as himself. And the wife see that she reverence her husband. I pray that your family will be a godly family. A spiritual family. A glorious family. I was waiting for a, an amen over there. And then we can transfer that to the church. And the church will be a glorious church. A pure church. And a glorious bride. We come to Revelation chapter 19. And I read here from verse 7. Revelation chapter 19, verse 7. It says, Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife has made herself ready. Again, you see here, it's talking about Christ, and it's talking about the fact that Christ is coming. He's coming, he'll appear in the sky, coming in the rapture, and he'll take the church, he'll catch the church away, and it says, we which are alive shall be caught up together with those who resurrect, and we shall ever be with the Lord, and he says, comfort ye one another with these words. And now he says, let's be glad, let's rejoice. It's like, you know, John, the beloved, he sees the revelation already. Because Christ now, in that revelation has come. And the bride is ready. You will be ready. The church is ready. You'll be ready. And they're caught up. And he says, because of that, because of that marriage supper of the Lamb. We're going to all rejoice, and it says in verse 8, And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. We need to be clothed in righteousness, in holiness, in divine character, in the kind of character and the life that the bridegroom, that Christ wants, that he paid for, that he died for, 
so that we can be glorious in his sight. Look at verse 9. And he says unto me, Right, blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he says unto me, These are the true sayings of God. And I pray that these sayings of God will take root in every heart. I will influence every life so that we'll be ready for the coming bridegroom. As we've seen on your program, we're talking on the bride's covenant with the heavenly bridegroom. The bride's covenant with the heavenly bridegroom. Already you know from all the references we have read, the bride refers to the church. And the bridegroom refers to the Lord Jesus Christ. That's talking about then the covenant between Christ and the church. The covenant between the bridegroom and the bride. The covenant that was made, contracted, and sealed on the cross of Calvary. And the moment you turn away from your sin and you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you take Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you come into that covenant. You as an individual, you're a Christian. We as a body, we're a church, an assembly of called out people, called out to serve the Lord, called out to love the Lord, called out to be faithful, to be loyal unto the Lord to the very end of time. Until he comes, you'll be faithful. Till he comes, you'll be loving. Till he comes, you give your whole heart, everything you've got unto him, and the Lord will be pleased with you in Jesus' name. Three things we're going to look at. Number one, the bride's conversion and clothing by the bridegroom. The bride's conversion and clothing by the bridegroom. Point number two, the bride's consecration and cleansing by the bridegroom. The bride's consecration and cleansing by the bridegroom. Point number three, the bride's covenant and cleaving to the bridegroom. The bride's covenant and cleaving to the bridegroom. Number one is the conversion and the clothing by the bridegroom. You see, a sinner cannot be with Christ as part of him because Christ is sinless, Christ is spotless, Christ is holy, Christ is good, Christ is all that heaven desires. The sinner is sinful, is depraved, is unrighteous, is unholy, is a transgressor, is full of iniquity, and two cannot walk together except they be agreed. And the only way a sinner will come to the Savior and they be linked together and become part of the church and part of the bride, and they'll have covenant together. The only way is to have conversion. There must be conversion. Two cannot work together except they be agreed. Understand? The sinner is a child of the devil. The sinner is a person following Satan. And his heart, his life, his commitment, everything is dedicated to the devil. And Jesus Christ is dedicated to heaven and to God, the heavenly father. And the sinner that is dedicated to Satan cannot have that close relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why, number one, there must be conversion, conversion. And then the sinner is naked, naked to shame. Since Adam and Eve ate the forbidden fruit and they became naked, everybody is born into this world naked, naked of, of righteousness, naked of holiness, naked of the divine nature. And now the sinner must be converted and must be closed by the bridegroom so that now 
there can be that union. There can be that covenant. Number one in that part is the conversion. We're looking at Acts of the Apostles chapter 3. Acts of the Apostles chapter 3. And I'm reading from verse 19. Acts chapter 3. Verse 19. Here is the requirement of the Lord. If we're going to be part of his bride. Here's the requirement of the Lord. If we're going to be joined to him in divine, heavenly, holy matrimony. It says in Acts chapter 3 verse 19. Repent ye therefore and be converted. You see that is the very beginning. It's what must happen. Repent ye therefore and be converted. That your sins may be blotted out. When the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. That's what happens. You turn away from sin. You cannot save yourself. You cannot forgive yourself. You cannot cleanse yourself. You cannot make yourself righteous. You cannot say I'm turning over a new leaf. That's what the Lord will do. But you need to take a decision. And you need to say, I turn away from Satan. I turn away from sin. I turn away from self. I turn away from everything bad. Everything that is bad in society. And I turn unto the Lord. That turning is referred to as repentance. Repent ye therefore and be converted. There's a change inside you. There's a transformation inside you. There is something that Christ himself does. He converts you. He makes you a new creature. And then he says, the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. Look at verse 26. Unto you first, God, having raised up a son, Jesus, sent him to bless you. In turning away every one of you from his iniquity, from his transgression, from his wickedness, from his evil deeds, from his bad character. It brings you in and then it washes you. If it has not taken place, it will happen. I said it will happen. Look at Psalm 51. Psalm 51. I'm reading from verse 5. Psalm 51 verse 5. Conversion is necessary before you can become part of the bride of Christ. The bride's conversion and clothing. In Psalm 51, reading from verse 5, here is the confession of the psalmist. And this confession is true of everyone here on earth. It says, Behold, I was shapen in iniquity. And you see, did my mother conceive me? He said, when I came to this world, I came with a sinful nature. I came with a depraved nature. I came with a dirty heart. I came with a, a bench towards evil, propensity towards evil. He says, behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts. And in the hidden part, thou shalt make me to know wisdom. And now he's asking that God himself will forgive, will cleanse, will change, will purge, will make him a different person than he was when he came to this world. Purge me with Esau, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. The Lord can do it. And the Lord will do it. And the Lord will do it to his own satisfaction that he'll make you in his own sight. You know, you, you can be good enough in the sight of people around you. You can even be good enough in your own sight. But we're talking about being good enough in the sight of the Lord to be a bride, to be a part of the bride of Christ. Make me to hear joy and gladness that the bones which thou hast broken me rejoice. Hide thy face from my sins. Blot out all my iniquities. How many iniquities will it blot out? Everything. Look at verse 10. Create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence. And take not the Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. Salvation as joy. I say salvation as joy. Salvation has peace. Salvation has happiness. Salvation has assurance. It said to your mind, it says, restore that unto me, the joy of thy salvation, and uphold me with thy free spirit. Verse 13, then will I teach transgressors thy ways, 
And sinners shall be, tell me the word, converted unto thee. You see that? There is conversion. There is conversion. And it is that conversion that brings you into the body of Christ. You are um, an aged person. You are an older person. The conversion that brings you into the body of Christ. Somebody said, I was born a Christian. Uh-uh, there's nothing like that. You were born a sinner. All I've seen, and come short of the glory of God. Somebody said, I've been a member of the body of Christ since I was born. There's nothing like that. Except a man be born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. There must be conversion. There must be a definite time in your life when you said, I heard the good news. I heard the gospel. I knew that Jesus and Jesus only can save. I turned away from my sin. I turned to the Lord. I believed that he died for me on the cross of Calvary. And he rose again for my justification. Now... The spirit bears witness in my heart. I am saved. That's salvation. That's how you come into the body of Christ and become part of the bride. Isaiah chapter 1. Reading from verse 18. Isaiah chapter 1 verse 18. Come now. You see that? You need to take that step. Come now. You need to take that step of personal decision. Come now. And let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. What the Lord is saying there is that however deep the sins might be, however dyed the sins might be, when he saves you, he saves you completely. I said he saves you completely. He does not say partially. You know, I've been smoking before, but, uh, you know, I smoke less now. Uh-uh. It takes everything away from you. I've been committing sin before, but I do it less now. Uh-uh. It takes everything away from you. And if he has not done it, today is that time he'll do it in Jesus' name. We're looking at Isaiah chapter 43. Isaiah chapter 43, verse 25. What it does when that conversion takes place. In Isaiah chapter 43, verse 25, I, even I, I am he that blotted, blotted out thy transgressions. For mine own sake, I will not remember thy sins. That's the conversion. The sins are taken away. The sins are blotted out. And then there's no remembrance of them in the presence of the Lord anymore. Matthew chapter 18, we're reading from verse 3. Matthew chapter 18, verse 3. The conversion that takes place, that must take place before you can become part of the bride, part of the body of Christ. Look at this, Matthew chapter 18, verse 3. And it says and said, Verily, 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 I say unto you, Except ye be converted and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Except ye be converted and become as little children. Your heart becomes innocent. Your heart becomes free. The sins are taken away and washed away. It says, except that happens, you cannot be part of the kingdom of God. There's a question here. What if you were converted before? And it was a real change, a real transformation, a real newness of life. And then something happened. You yielded to temptation and you went back to the scenes of the old life. What happens? Look at James chapter 5. James chapter 5. You came to the Lord before. You knew the Lord before. You were sure of salvation before. And you were following the Lord, obeying the Lord. You were part of the bride. And something happened. That you went back to sin. You backslid. You started living in sin. And you made Satan your Lord and Master. And you made the world your pattern. And you forgot the word of God. Now that you hear about the bride, what do you do? Look at this. James chapter 5, verse 19. Brethren, if any of you do err from the truth and one convert him, you need conversion again. If any of you, brethren, a brother, a sister, a child of God, but he erred from the truth, he went astray and he gave his life to sinning, transgression, 
iniquity, abomination, worldliness. And now he's saying about the bride. And he says, I want to be part of the bride. You need conversion. You need a change. You need a transformation. If any of you hear from the truth and one convert him, let him know that he which converted the sinner, the backslider is now a sinner. He which converted the sinner from the air of his way shall save his soul from death and hide, shall hide a multitude of sins. Now you understand? Conversion, that's something clothing by the bridegroom. You cannot just say, okay, I'm forgiven, I'm washed, I'm clean, and then you come out without any clothing. You cannot do that. You're having wedding, and you're being joined to the Lord publicly. You must be closed. Look at Matthew chapter 22. The clothing that comes by the bridegroom. We're reading from Matthew chapter 22. First of all, I read verse 2. In verse 2, it says, And the, king, the, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a certain king, which made a marriage for his son. And then they brought in quite a lot of people. And then we're told in verse 11, And when the king came in to see the guests, he saw there a man which had not a wedding garment. This one just felt, well, I think I can come in. Invitation is for everyone because it says, Whosoever will, let him come, let him come, let him come. And so I watch, and so I come. Yes, it's wonderful you are deciding to come. You must turn away from sin, but be cleansed and washed in the blood of the Lamb. And then you must be closed. It says in verse 12, and it says unto him, French, how camest thou in hither, not having a wedding garment? And he was speechless. He wasn't properly closed. And so, as you come and you're part of the bride, you must be properly closed. Look at verse 13. Then said the king to the servants, bind him, hand and foot, and take him away, and cast him into the outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. See the application. See the conclusion. And see what the Lord Jesus Christ is saying concerning that. For many are called, but, tell me, many are called, but, tell me out aloud, few are chosen. Those who are not converted, even though they come, they come to the physical, natural, visible body of Christ. They are not part of the bride. They are not cleansed. They are not washed. They are not converted. They are not clothed in his righteousness. Many are called, but few are chosen. He wants you to be closed. Look at Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3, we're reading from verses 4 and 5. You cannot just come naked in the sight of the Lord, not clothed in this righteousness, not clothed with the righteousness he provided on the cross of Calvary. It tells us in Revelation chapter 3 and verses 4 and 5. And here he's talking about something spiritual to you understand. It says in verse 4, it says, Thou hast a few names, even in Sardis, which have not defiled their garments. Their clothing, spiritual clothing. They shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. The white raiment, you find, it's in the word of God. It refers to the righteousness of the saints. He that overcometh, the same shall be clothed in white raiment. You see that? He that overcometh is no more yielded to sin. It's no more yielding to the flesh. It's no more yielding to evil. He that overcometh, the same shall be clothed in white raiment. And I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. Look at chapter, uh, at chapter 3, and I'm reading from verse 18. I counsel thee, verse 18, to buy of me gold, tried in the fire. That thou mayest be rich and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. Amen. 
Amen. Chapter 7, Revelation chapter 7. And here we're reading from verse 9. Revelation chapter 7, we're looking at it from verse 9. Here is the bride. Here is the bride. Here is the bride. Here is the glorious church. After this I beheld, and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number of all nations. Thank God I'm part of this. I said, thank God I'm part of this. You'll be part in Jesus' name. And kindred and people and tongues stood before the throne and before the Lamb. Closed, look at that. Closed, you see that? Closed with white robes and palms in their hands. And cried with a loud voice saying, salvation to our God. These are people that have salvation. These are people that have conversion. These are people whose lives have been turned around by the grace of God, by the washing of the blood of the Lamb. It must happen to you. I said it must happen to you. If you're going to get to heaven, if you're going to be part of the bride, this must have record in heaven that there was a day, there was a time, there was a moment when you took the decision and you turned away from sin and you turned to the Savior. And now you can shout and now you can cry aloud for the rest of the bride, salvation to our God, which seated upon the throne and unto the Lamb. And all the angels stood round about the throne and about the elders and the four beast living creatures and fell before the throne on their faces and worshiped God, saying, Amen. Somebody shout, Amen. Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be unto our God forever and ever. Amen. And one of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes? You see that? Who are these who are arrayed in white robes? And whence came they? And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said unto me, These are they which came out of the great trouble of great tribulation, great trial. Great trouble, great persecution. They came out of the world and they have washed their robes. It's mentioning the robes again. He mentioned that robe. He mentioned the robes in verse 9. He mentioned the robes also in verse 13. And now in verse 14, they have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore, are they before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple? And he that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them. They shall hunger no more. Thank God you'll be there. I say, thank God you'll be there. If you miss anything in the world, don't miss this one. Don't miss this one because they shall hunger no more, neither thirst anymore, neither shall the sun light on them, nor any heat. For the Lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them and shall lead them unto living waters, living fountains of waters, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. I'll be there. I said, I'll be there. I said, I'll be there. You'll be there in Jesus' name. Revelation chapter 16. I'm reading from verse 15. The bride has been converted. And the bride has been closed. In Revelation chapter 16, verse 15. Behold, I come and say, see. Blessed is he that watches and keepeth his garments. You watch so that you don't become dirty. You watch so that you don't become naked lest you walk naked and you see his shame. Revelation chapter 19 again. Revelation chapter 19. I'm reading here from verse 7. Revelation chapter 19 verse 7. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him. For the marriage of the Lamb is come and his wife has made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. Here is the interpretation of the fine linen. Here is the interpretation of the garment. For the fine linen is, tell me. For the fine linen is, tell me what you read there. Tell me, unison, one, two, three, go. 
the righteousness of the saints. And so we have the bride's conversion and clothing by the bridegroom. We're coming to point number two now. The bride's consecration and cleansing by the bridegroom. You're familiar with the human family. You're part of the human family. Either you're a husband or you're a wife. Or maybe you're a child. You have daddy, you have mommy. They married together before you were born. And so we understand if there is going to be a standing family, they're committed to each other. That means the wife is committed to the husband. The wife is consecrated to the husband. The wife is fully surrendered unto the husband. And the wife is yielding to the husband in everything. If it's, if it's a biblical family. And the husband too is committed to the wife. And the husband is consecrated unto the wife. They are together. They think of each other. They love each other. They plan well for each other. They think good of each other. And everything one has belongs to the other. Everything the wife has belongs to the husband. Everything the husband has belongs to the, belongs to the wife. The same thing with the bride, the church, and the bridegroom, the Lord Jesus Christ. There is that consecration. And there is that cleansing. Look at the consecration. It tells us in Proverbs chapter 23. Proverbs chapter 23. I'm reading from verse 26. Proverbs chapter 23. Reading from verse 26. It tells us in verse 26. This is the Lord himself saying, My son, give me thine heart and let thine eyes observe my ways. That's the Lord telling us this consecration when you give your heart fully to the Lord without any rival, without any reservation, and without relenting. Number one, without any rival, you give yourself to the Lord wholeheartedly, all your heart, all your soul, all your mind. You're giving to the Lord and there's no rival. You're not giving part of your life to Satan, part of your life to a man somewhere, part of your life to a woman somewhere. You're not being loyal, faithful to another man somewhere, another woman somewhere, any other person. Give me thine heart and let thine eyes observe my ways. You give him yourself without any rival. You give him yourself without any reservation. You're not reserving anything, okay? I give you this, but this area I don't touch. I give you this, but in this area it's a no-go area. I'm going to hold on to this. I'm going to control this. I'm going to sit on this. That's nothing like that. Without reservation. You give yourself to the Lord without relenting. You're not, you know, doing like, okay, I give you myself. Lord, I'm sorry. I discovered that I need this other thing for myself. I'm going to take that away. You don't relate. You don't change. And that is what the Lord is saying. That you consecrate yourself to the Lord fully. Another way of saying that is in Matthew chapter 22. Matthew chapter 22. And we're reading from verse 37. Matthew chapter 22 verse 37. Yet Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. That's the consecration. That there's nothing in the world that part of your heart is loving, contrary to the demand of the Lord. All your heart, all your soul, all your mind, you love the Lord. You love him, you love his word. You love him, you love his work. You love him, you love his ways. You love him, you love his will. You love the Lord, you love the word of the Lord with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind. You love the Lord, you love his work, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength. You love the Lord, you love his ways with all your soul, with all your heart, with all your mind. You love the Lord and you love his will. Whatever his will is, you're not going to say, Lord, it's going to be 50-50. I'm going to go along with you 50% and then I'm going to go my way 50%. See what Jesus said, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. That's the consecration we're talking about. That's the consecration the Bible is talking about. There's no reservation, there's no rival, there's no relenting. We're looking at uh, Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10, reading from verse 37. 
the consecration of the bride, the surrender of the bride, the loyalty of the bride, the faithfulness of the bride, the total yieldedness of the bride. In Matthew chapter 10, verse 37, he that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Look up here for a moment. The Lord is uh, making use of the strongest relationship on earth. You are attached to daddy. You are attached to mommy. And it says, you must understand, when you become a Christian, when you become a believer, when you become a bride, you remember? The word of God says, for this cause shall a man leave father and mother and be joined unto his wife and they two shall become twain they shall become one they two shall become one that means then you love your husband more than daddy and mommy you love your wife more than daddy and mommy and the lord is saying the same thing here he's saying if you're part of the bride there's consecration there's absolute surrender. There's absolute yieldedness. And it says, He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Think about it this way. Uh, when you, as a son to your dad, as a son or daughter to your mom, you love dad and mom more than money. How about that? Because if dad is sick and you have money, Whatever you have to spend, you're going to spend everything on daddy and mommy until they get well. Because you love daddy and mommy more than money. If you have a house and uh, daddy has no accommodation, you love your dad, you love your mom, you're going to give them accommodation there. Why? Because you love your daddy and your mommy more than the accommodation. And if there is uh, any friend of yours that is uh, trying to insult your daddy or your mommy, you say, I'm sorry, we're partying. Why? Because you love your daddy and your mommy more than your friend, more than anything on earth. What the Lord is saying is the one you love most. You say, I have to love me higher than them. And you can look at it this way. He that loveth money or material things more than me is not worthy of me. He that loveth house or business more than me is not worthy of me. He that loves a club, a society more than me is not worthy of me. He that loves tradition more than me, it's not worthy of me. It's saying, there's nothing you're going to love above the Lord. You love him with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. That's the consecration of the bride. He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he that taketh not up his cross and followeth me after me is not worthy of me. I pray that his love will be uppermost in your heart. I lost an amen there. And his love will be the greatest thing in your life in Jesus' name. That's why the Lord is asking you the question about consecration in John chapter 21. John chapter 21. I'm reading from verse 15. John chapter 21 verse 15. It says, so then... When they had died, Jesus said unto Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? Look at the fish. Lovest thou me more than these? Look at business. Lovest thou me more than these? Look at market. Lovest thou me more than these? Look at commerce. Lovest thou me more than these? Look at chieftain C title. Lovest thou me more than these? Look at society. They are calling you. Come and do this. Come and do that. And nothing will take you away from the service of the Lord. Lovest thou me more than these? That's the consecration the Lord is talking about. And when you love the Lord with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind, there will be no problem at all. You will not abandon the service of God, the worship of God for anything on earth because God is number one. Christ is number one. Give me a good amen. 
Revelation chapter, Revelation chapter 2, and I'm reading from verse 4. Revelation chapter 2, verse 4. It says, Nevertheless, I have some watch against thee. You're active, yet I have something against thee. You hold the Bible, yet I have something against thee. You profess salvation, yes, I have something against thee. Because if you're going to be a bride, think about the human family, the husband and the wife. The wife is cooking well. The wife is, uh, you know, living at home. The wife is, you know, everything that the husband expects her to be, except one thing, except one thing. Her heart is not fully for the husband. She has another attraction, another scene, another pull that is pulling her in any other direction. Whatever the wife is doing, the husband will not be happy. And that's what Jesus is saying. He's saying, I know that you're preaching my word. I know you believe in sound doctrine. I know that you are testing those people that say they're apostles and they're not. You find them liars, you're not going to cooperate with them. I know that you are born. I know that you are active. And I know that you are patient and persevering. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee because thou hast left thy first love. Thou hast left thy first love. Remember therefore from whence thou art fallen and repent. And do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly and remove thy candlestick and remove thy privilege and remove the association and remove the covenant and remove everything that holds us together out of his place except thou repent. He wants us to love him with all our heart, all our soul, and all our mind. And thank God that's what you are going to do. I say thank God that's what you are going to do. Therefore, that's the consecration. But you know, there's something else that is cleansing. It's cleansing. It cleanses the bride. It purges the bride. We're coming to Psalm 19, and I'm reading from verse 12. Psalm 19, and we're reading from verse 12. There is consecration, there is cleansing. Consecration and cleansing. It tells us in Psalm 12, and verse uh, Psalm 19, verse 12. Who can understand his errors? Cleanse me, cleanse thou me from my secret faults. Cleanse thou me from my secret faults. What's that telling us? It's telling us something about the Lord Jesus Christ. His superior eyes are to behold iniquity. He knows us. He knows the standard. Standard of holiness, he knows. Standard of righteousness, he knows. Standard of purity, he knows. Standard of heavenly mindedness, he knows. And here you are, and you say, I'm a Christian, my Christian, I'm part of the bride. And he says, come on here. I see something you don't see. I see your love that you don't see. I see where you place your interest is a secret fault. And you have not seen it. That's why the service is praying, cleanse me from secret faults. It tells us in Psalm 51. Psalm 51. And I'm reading from verse 2. Psalm 51. Reading from verse 2. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity. Wash me so thoroughly, you'll not see any stain in me anymore. And he says, cleanse me from my sin. Cleanse me from my sin. Uh, you know, sometimes uh, uh, there is a bride, there's a wife to the husband. And she loves the husband. She's devoted to the husband. She's submissive to the husband. But she, uh, she also interacts with other uh, wives in the community. She interacts with other women in the community. And then the other women are saying, well, with my husband, this is how we do it. With my husband, this is how we live. And if my husband goes this far, I say, come on, stop. 50-50, here am I, there you are. And not your wife who has been giving 100%. is already thinking, uh-uh, look at this. That woman is telling me this. That woman is telling me that bride is telling me this. And without knowing, she begins to change little by little because of the influence of other wives, the influence of other women. You know, sometimes it's like that. There are, there are some women that have this association of the wives of so-and-so, X, Y, Z. And their interaction will be rubbing up on each other. Or there are people that are reading some materials. In Japan, this is how wives behave to their husband. In India, this is how wives behave to their husband. 
In America, this is how wives behave to the husband. In Europe, this is how wives behave to the husband. And because of the reading, they borrow this and they borrow this and they borrow that. And the bridegroom, the husband, is saying, this is not right. This is not right. Oh, she said, I got that from America. I got that from India. I got that from Japan. And sometimes the bride of Christ, sometimes the church, sometimes you, you might interact with other people. That's a Christian. That's a Christian. That's a Christian. And you're borrowing some of the things they're doing. And then they come sin. And you're asking the Lord to cleanse me from my sin. He will cleanse you. I said he will cleanse us. Look at verse 7. Punch me with Esau, and I shall be clean. That's the cleansing. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Not only as white as snow, you'll be whiter than snow today. I said you'll be whiter than snow today. Look at verse 10. Create in me a clean heart to God and renew a right spirit within me. Ezekiel chapter 36. Ezekiel chapter 36. I'm reading from verse 25. Ezekiel. Chapter 36, and we're reading from verse 25. It tells us in verse 25, it says, uh, Then when I sprinkle clean water upon you, and you shall be clean. Today you'll be clean. I said today you'll be clean. And you shall be clean. And from all your filthiness, and from all your idols. And from all your idols. You know, there are times business becomes an idol. There are times something in life becomes an idol. There are times something like a project becomes an idol. There are times that sometimes it's a proposal. It becomes an idol. There are sometimes the plans that you have becomes an idol. Some possession may become an idol. That you know you are not seeing it. You are looking at it. You are looking it over. And it's like the major sin in your life. And you are talking about it every time. You are dancing around it every time. If it is booming. If it is going on. You have fullness of joy. If it is going down. Uh, then it brings sorrow. It's even taking the Bible from your hand, becoming an idol. It's taking the service of God from your hand and becoming an idol. It's taking the word of God, the word of life and it's taking desire for heaven out of your hand. It's taking desire for the coming of the Lord out of your heart. It becomes an idol and the Lord is going to cleanse us. I said the Lord is going to cleanse us. Anything you love more than God Anything you appreciate more than God, anything your heart is running after more than God, it says, and I will cleanse you from all your idols, and ye shall be clean. Look at verse 26. A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you, and I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you a new heart. I thought you'd say amen there. Look at Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. We're looking at verse 26. Ephesians chapter 5. We're reading from verse 26. It says in verse 26 that he might sanctify and cleanse it on the washing of water by the word. That's what the bridegroom will do. That's what the bridegroom will do. He will sanctify. I said he will sanctify. He has made the provision for sanctification. He will sanctify you. He has made the, he's even making it a session. He prayed for us, he will sanctify us. And then it says that he might sanctify and cleanse it of the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Holy and without blemish. Holy. And without blemish, it's about to happen. It will happen. I said it will happen. Heaven will look at you, it will not see any blemish. Heaven will look at you, will not see any spot. Your heart cleansed, purged, purified, sanctified, made completely holy. It tells us in first in first John chapter one. First John chapter one. Reading from verse 7. In 1 John chapter 1 verse 7. But if we walk in the light. 
Those are Christians having the grace to walk in the light. But if we walk in the light, those are the people that, that have received light from the Lord Jesus Christ. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. The blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. The bride's consecration and cleansing by the bridegroom. We'll come to point number three. In point number three, the bride's covenant and cleaving to the bridegroom. The bride's covenant and cleaving to the bridegroom. We need to understand the relationship between the bride and the bridegroom. The wife and the husband is a relationship of covenant, not contract. You know, when you think of marriage like a contract, we have contract, and uh, here is husband, here is wife, and uh, you know, there is another contract that is uh, going to enrich your life more. Another contract that looks appealing more. You'll find a way to stop this contract so that you can go to this contract. But marriage is not a contract. It's a covenant. Look at the language of the scriptures. We're looking at Malachi chapter 2. Malachi chapter 2 is not a contract. This is a covenant. Somebody give me the word covenant. Somebody shout on the word covenant. Thank you. God bless you. Malachi chapter 2. We're looking at verse 14. Malachi chapter 2 verse 14. Yet you say, wherefore? Because the Lord has been witness between thee and the wife of thy youth. The Lord has been witness between thee and the wife of thy youth. Against whom thou hast dealt treacherously. Yet... Is she thy companion? Is she your companion? There's a covenant. And the wife of thy covenant. It's a covenant. It's a covenant. You come together. And then you leave your father. You leave your mother. You are joined unto your wife. And you become one together. That is a covenant. Do you know that when we came to the Lord Jesus Christ, it was a fulfillment of a covenant? We're looking at Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1, I'm reading from verse 72. Luke chapter 1, verse 72. To perform the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant. To remember, it's only covenant. It's a covenant that brought us to the Lord Jesus Christ. And then it says the oath, which is where? To our father Abraham, that he will grant unto us that we have been delivered out of the hand of our enemies, might serve him. How do you serve him? Might serve him. How do you serve him? Without fear. You know, if you're, if you're really going to get married to somebody and then your old boyfriends are still a sin, are we hearing something? What are we doing? What are you doing? And what information are we hearing? If you go ahead with that, you don't know what will happen. Now, if you have fear for them, you cannot be married to this man. If you're still part of your heart, it's still for that to all those men, and you're afraid of what they might do. You're afraid you might lose whatever they were giving you before. You're not married. You're not married. If you're going to really marry that man, then you're married to him in that covenant without fear. You know, sometimes uh, it may be that you want to get married, but they say that this tribe does not marry that tribe. And then if your parents hear, they say, what decision are you trying to take? Because you understand, we don't marry from that area. They are this or they are that. If you have the fear of that, you're not going to get married to that man. It is when there's no fear in your heart. You say, that's the man that is the will of God. That's the woman that is the will of God for me. And I don't have fear of anything. This is my decision. I'm going into the covenant and thank God that marriage will succeed. I didn't hear the amen of the church. I said, your marriage will succeed. It says that my serving without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our lives. All the days of our lives. When does the wife stop loving the husband? 
I said, when does the wife stop loving the husband? It's all the days of your life you're going to love each other. You'll never stop. I said you'll never stop. The same thing with Christ and the church. All the days of our lives, we love what he loves and we hate what he hates. All the days of our lives, we go the direction he's calling us and we do what he's calling us to do in holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our life. It's a covenant. It's a covenant. And I pray that you'll be a part of that covenant. Look at Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews chapter 13. I'm reading from verse, I'm reading from verse 20. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 20. It says, Now the God of peace that brought again from the dead and Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of what kind of covenant? I say, What kind of covenant? The blood of the everlasting covenant make you perfect in every good work to do his will working in you that which is well pleasing in, the, in his sight through the Jesus Christ to whom be glory forever and ever in your life forever and ever in your heart forever and ever that he meant for of yours will be registered in heaven on your behalf in Jesus' name. Yeah. Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 10, Hebrews chapter 10. I'm reading from verse 16. Hebrews chapter 10, reading from verse 16. It says, This is a covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. This is the covenant that I'll make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their hearts. And in their minds, I will write them. And then it says, And their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Now where the remission, where remission, remover, forgiveness, redemption of these is. There is, uh, no, there is no more offering for sin. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he has consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say his flesh. And having an high priest over the house of God, let us draw near, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering. You will hold fast unto the end in Jesus' name. For he is faithful that promised. He is faithful that promised. He is faithful. He will never disappoint us. I said he will never disappoint you. You are joined to the Lord. He will keep you faithful until the coming of the Lord in Jesus' name. We have a covenant with the bridegroom and we're cleaving to the bridegroom. Cleaving to the bridegroom. That's the essence of marriage. That's the essence of marriage. We're together. We're together. And you're together until death do you part. But you understand in our own marriage now with the Lord Jesus Christ, Christ will never die again. He died. He was buried. He rose again. His beat is gone to heaven. And he says, In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have called, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And then he says, When I prepare the place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, so that where I am, there you will be also. You'll be there. I said, You'll be there. You have no seat in hell. Your seat, your station, your status, your place is in heaven. You'll be there in Jesus' name. Look at Genesis, Genesis chapter 2. I'm reading from verse 24. Genesis chapter 2. We're looking at verse 24. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife. And they twain, they shall be one flesh. You leave, you cleave. You leave, you cleave. You leave, and then you cleave unto the Lord. Uh, look at the language of the scriptures concerning our relationship, a covenant with the Lord. In Deuteronomy chapter 10, 
Deuteronomy chapter 10, reading from verse 20. Deuteronomy chapter 10, reading from verse 20. You cleave, cleave unto the Lord. It says, Thou shalt fear the Lord thy God, and him shalt thou serve, and to him shalt thou cleave, and swear by his name. To him shalt thou cleave, and swear by his name. Deuteronomy chapter 30. And we're reading from verse 6 and then verse 20. Deuteronomy chapter 30. Look at verse 6. It says, And the Lord thy God will circumcise thine heart. The Lord thy God will circumcise thine heart. Is thy God because you are saved? Is thy God because you are born again? Is thy God because he has called you out of the world into his kingdom? And now, after calling you and you are now in the kingdom, he will circumcise your heart. And the heart of thy seed to love the Lord with all thine heart and with all thy soul that thou mayest live. Look at verse 20 there. In verse 20, that thou mayest love the Lord thy God and that thou mayest obey his voice, that thou mayest cleave unto him cleave unto him. You are joined to him. You are never to be separated again. Nothing will separate you from the Lord. You will not part from the Lord. You cleave unto him, for he is thy life, and the length of thy days, that thou mayest dwell in the land which the Lord swear unto thy fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give unto them. We're looking at uh, Joshua chapter 22, verse 5. Joshua chapter 22, verse 5. But take diligent heed to do the commandment and the law, which Moses, the servant of the Lord, charged you. Look at this. To love the Lord thy God, and to walk in all his ways, and to keep his commandments, and to, tell me the word you find there, cleave unto him, cleave unto him, and to serve him with all your heart and with all your soul. You will cleave unto the Lord. You'll be joined fully to the Lord and you'll never leave him anymore in Jesus' name. Acts of the Apostles chapter 11 verse 23. Acts chapter 11 verse 23. Acts chapter 11. We're looking at verse 23. When he came and had seen the grace of God was glad. The grace of God will be visible in your life. Visible in your character. Visible in your behavior. Visible coming out of your heart to everyone around you in Jesus' name. That brother around you there will say the grace of God in your life. That sister around you there will say the grace of God in your life. When you get back home, daddy, mommy, they'll see the grace of God in your life. Husband, wife, they'll see the grace of God in your life. In your place of work, we'll see the grace of God. And as I move around, I look at you, you'll be the joy of my heart. I will see more of the grace of God in your life in Jesus' name. But look at this, look at this. So when he came and had seen the grace of God, he was glad and exhorted them all that with purpose of heart they will cleave unto the Lord. Old Testament, New Testament, they will cleave unto the Lord. We're not the bride of Christ. Because of combustion, we're not the bride of Christ. He has closed us. We're not the bride of Christ. We're consecrated, submissive, loyal, faithful to the Lord. We're not the bride of Christ. He has cleansed us by the blood of the Lamb. We're not the bride of Christ. We have covenant with Him. We're not the bride of Christ. We're cleaving to the Lord. You have come to put your faith and your trust in the Lord. You'll never go back. I said you'll never go back. He wants to perfect us. He wants to purify us. He wants to make us holier. He wants to make us go deeper in our relationship with himself. And it's right now there by your side. He says, give me all of yourself. I know that you've given part of yourself. You serve me. You, wo you worship me. But give me all of yourself. And then I will close you all over again. And I will cleanse you all over again. And then there will be a cleaving. A glue will come from heaven. You will be joined to the Lord. Never, never, never to part from the Lord anymore. Somebody, are you ready there? I said, are you ready there? 
Why don't you rise up and tell the Lord, why don't you rise up and be part of the bride? The bride of Christ. The bride of Christ. The bride of Christ. Why don't you come and say, Lord, here am I. Here am I. Totally. Completely. Entirely. Without a rival. Without any reservation. Without any relenting. Without looking back. I give myself afresh unto you. The Lord wants to do a deeper work of grace in your heart right now. He has saved you. He will sanctify you. He has given you righteousness. He will give you heart holiness. He will prepare you for heaven. So when the trumpet shall sound, you will not be missed out in Jesus' name. Open your mouth and talk to the Lord in prayer.